this is working anyway, is it? Yes, it is. It is? Okay. Okay. Testing. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. It's great to be here. I've, I've done some talks in some different places, and this is a, a different place. I did one of these at a whiskey circle once, so it's uh, yeah, interesting. We'll go anywhere to promote mentoring men. So just briefly about mentoring men, we're a, a registered uh, not-for-profit organisation. Uh, we launched in 2018, and all men, regardless of their background or beliefs, are welcome to engage in our program. I saw this uh, graph today which shows of all the countries listed, this is looking at the household wealth per, per person and Australia is easily got the greatest wealth of this, this list here and in the worldwide sense we're, we're second. It's, it's, it, I think it's going to keep doing this. <laughs> Just to test it. Um, and Australia is next to Switzerland. And you would think despite this, in view of this wealth, we'd be in a great position. But the reality is, and frequent studies have shown this, that Australian men have never been more lonely, isolated, anxious, depressed, or suicidal. And it begs the question as to why. And I, I've looked at some aspects over my lifetime, and the first thing I came up with was a community. When I grew up as a kid, we had a village type concept. We knew all the neighbours, they were all safe places to go. We would frequently go over there for a cup of tea. We never had a telephone. The lady, Mrs. Ryan, three doors down, would take calls and come up and tell us when there was a phone call. So it's this total sense of, of the village there. Um, the church played a much uh, stronger role. The church was a, a means of connection for people who were isolated but with the re reduction in the, the church's influence in the Western world, it's been another loss. And also, I didn't know anyone divorced when I was growing up. It was incredibly rare. A lot of families had issues, but there was generally the, the mother and father, whereas nowadays that's becoming less and less likely. So there's a lot of, a lot of kids, and, and especially impacting boys, growing up without a male role model or a father in their life. The next thing was the livestock. Um, we do far less exercise than what we used to do. Most of the guys I went to school with, we played football, we played cricket, we are always outside playing in the street. Uh, and there's a definite relationship between physical exercise and good mental health. Um, the foods, we, we never had takeaway food. There was no Maccas, there was no KFC. Um, and, uh, I think at the school I went to, about a thousand people, there might have been two of these kids there. The rest of us just looked like post-World War II, there was just we no carried any weight. Was, um, and the last one was the, I put here, the technology. And there's been massive increases in screen time. So I, I go back to pre-TV, but the TV, with the, the shows would go off, there'd be three or four channels, black and white, and there wasn't that much to watch. Now there's massive amounts of TV time, Netflix, kids playing computer games. Um, so less exercise inside, getting involved in these sort of things. And also, I thought of social media, which is insidious, I've got bullying, subconscious attack on our self-esteem. People post the best themselves on Facebook, things like that. Look at me, I'm traveling around the world, I'm not, not at the moment, but I've been traveling around. Look at the meal, look how good my life is. And Look how bad this, uh, this issue is. And I, I saw this cartoon recently, and I, I really related to this. So this is me, only 30, 40 years before this, but it's your 
we'd play out the streets and the instruction from Mum would be when the street lights come on, come inside. And you would play all day. And this is kick, get inside, come in for your dinner. And now it's get outside, put, put your gaming console down and get out and start doing some exercise. Just get outside. So, I've got this dream. I want to change the world. And I know that sounds incredibly, maybe far-fetched, but I believe it, it certainly happened. We just happened to chat with, uh, with Ben and Peter and we're seeing the world change. And I want to give a few examples of that and I believe we can change the world again. So the first thing here is, it's unbelievable. More doctors smoke camels. Um, more scientists and educators spoke Kent. Used to be the thing that my grandfather used to say, cigarettes for voters help you clear out your lungs. Yet within my lifetime, that's totally changed. And there's been a remarkable decline in smoke in Australia. And I don't know if you saw the figures last week, we've got the lowest rate of smoking that we've ever had. And it's down to 11%. I grew up in Victoria in 1969. 1,034 people died on the Victorian roads. And the Sun newspaper decided they were going to change the world. They launched a campaign and they lobbied the politicians. And as a result of that, I believe Victoria led the way within the world in terms of road safety. Seat belts were made compulsory, um, and vomitors, which are the early speed detectors, breathalysers were introduced. And there's been a 75% reduction in road deaths in Victoria, while the, the population has doubled and the number of cars on the road has more than doubled. Tremendous success, another example of where the world's been changed. Um, about two months ago, I had a melanoma removed from my head, my second melanoma. And I grew up in an environment where a tan, getting burned, was healthy. Healthy tan. And you, we used to put stuff on our cells to make us burn quicker and browner. It's insane. Um, and, but this, this is what we grew up with. And, and, uh, but you go past any school now and you see the impact of slip, slop, slap. All the kids have got hats on. Everyone put sunscreen on. So the world has changed that we're well aware now of the dangers of burning. And since we are just talking about this, oh, and we're talking about this. We just got to press the media. And this, as we speak today, there's now further changes going on. We've all got a fair bit of momentum. So there's clearly examples in my lifetime of the world changing for the good. A lot of examples for the bad, we can be changed. So the first thing I want to do to talk about is reframe. Um, vulnerability often is seen as a weakness, but to me it's a huge strength. I mean, you pick your mark, but it's a huge strength. And there's a quote there from Freud, out of vulnerabilities will come your strength. And we run uh, training courses for all, all our mentors, and one of the things we focus on is vulnerability. It's incredibly powerful. You're with a, a bunch of guys on your team, and you start to share some of the deep and dark things that we've been through. The second thing is this, a lot of confusion and, and, and crap around manhood. And I think back, growing up in Melbourne, we would go camping in the stress Lecky Ranges, a bunch of guys, my dad and his mates, all everyone had guns. And these guys would shoot anything. I remember one guy, he had a 303, he'd be trying to shoot wedge tail eagles. And I hated it. I hated it. I would stay home while they went out shooting. At that point I started to question, am I a real man because I don't want to go around killing things? And uh, because that was what men did. And I, I was talking to one of our mentors a few days ago and he, he cries a bit. And uh, he, 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 he comes from an Indian culture. And it's almost like that you're a girl. It, it's like this, this stupidity around this. So we need, we're actually going to put on a, a panel discussion in a few weeks, redefining what manhood is. And it's none of this shooting, non-crying uh, rubbish that we're talking about. And I'll talk a, a bit about this when I share my story in a second. But 
mentoring, the ability to have someone that you can openly share to is, is going to uh, 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 support you, encourage you, but most importantly, just listen. So that's how um, we want to start changing the world. So I'll just share a bit of my story. I was, uh, for most of my work, working life, I was an IT uh, project manager, just walk, worked up the road here, high paid. And then throughout 2013, I started to think there's got to be more to life than just making money and delivering software changes. And this played on my, I had, a, a, on the 10th of September 2013, I got on my, the train at Asquith to come to, to work and I started, or continued to read a book one of my daughters had given me. And the book just went straight into my head. It, it created the meaning of life. And it said, So it, it, it's, it portrayed what I've been doing up to that point, which is to get a job, get married, uh, have kids, I'm ticking these things off, buy a boat, tick that off. Then it said, hit age 59 and a half, collect retirement, travel, die. And I said the words just sunk right in. That was the 10th of September 2013. I was born on the 10th of March 1954. I was 59 and a half the day I read that. And it really got my attention. Then a couple of days later, I met a woman who was a friend of the daughter who gave me this book, never seen it before, an inspirational woman. She talked about mentoring me. So a few months later, I quit my job. I've had a paid job since. <clears throat> and I became a volunteer mentor, initially through the Rays Foundation into high schools. And then in addition to that, through the Kids Hope Program into primary schools. And then in addition to that, through the Coach Program into the family environment. And then in 2018, I've been mentoring this a young guy at one of the local Sydney high schools in the very first session <coughs> he shared with me that his father committed suicide his mum was an alcoholic in and out of rehab he was living with his grandparents which he hated and he just started crying and he said Ian help me and in the, this is with the Ray's Foundation with that model you can debrief with a counsellor so I started sharing what had happened looking for advice and she surprised me. She said, Ian, are you okay? And I said, I'm okay. And she asked again. And then I just started crying myself. And I realized it was this frustration. This kid's hurting, but I can't fix it. How do you help this, this kid's situation? <coughs> so I was flat for a few months, and then I realized I actually wanted a mentor myself. I wanted someone that I could talk to, just like these tens of people that I'd supported. So I did a Google search looking for a, a life mentor for men, and unbelievably there's nothing. Mm -hmm. We have a suicide rate that's three times that of women. When we're going through separation, it's 12 times that. We have all the issues we talked about before, the confusion around manhood and all that other stuff. And yet there was no free program for men. So I actually wrote a proposal to establish it, Another coincidence, a few weeks later, I, we met Julian Lisa, who was going to be one of the speakers tonight. He's the federal member for Barrow. Uh, Julian's father committed suicide. And uh, if you get a chance, it's worth watching his maiden speech in federal parliament. He's driven to improve the, the mental health of men to reduce suicide. And he signed on. Julian's our ambassador. And on the 10th of September, the same date, 10th of September, the date that changed my mind, my, my mind and my life, also happens to be World Suicide Prevention Day. And Julian arranged for uh, one of the directors and myself to go to Canberra to market. Uh, he, Julian introduced the breakfast, and we've just lost this again. <coughs> um, yeah, and... and uh, <laughs> thank you. Sorry about this. So this, so mentoring means started, this is by passion. I do this 10 hours a day, minimum seven days a week. And uh, I'm totally committed to this. We've, the program is now national. We've got mentors all over Australia and we're getting uh, uh, requests for mentors from overseas as well. We, in fact, we just started a relationship with a guy in Chile this week. Um, 
a couple of our mentors put together this video, which hopefully is going to make a noise. No, it's, oh, oh. it's muted. Mm -hmm. no, it's, Of this with my IT background. Uh, I'll go back. To I'll try it again. Yeah, thanks for this. suffer job loss, failed relationships, sickness or injury, addiction, loss of friends or loved ones, isolation or loneliness can set in or we feel a burden to others. As men are often reluctant to open up and talk, personal struggles can worsen. It can feel like we're on a conveyor belt with a loss of control over our life. Most mental health resources are allocated to men who are falling off the end of the belt, but at Mentoring Men, we have a different philosophy. Our free program focuses on early engagement and prevention. By having regular one-on-one -on -one conversations with a mentor, we can help. To decide if mentoring men is for you, please contact us. I just want to stress the conveyor belt. The majority of government resources, the majority of the, the, the funds, go to people in crisis. The, the political agenda is driven by the people in, in that area. We are early prevention. The guy who loses his job, where they're right at that point, or even before that point, not six months later when addictions develop, relationships are falling apart. So um, the, the head of suicide uh, uh, prevention Australia, Christine Morgan, said half the people who commit suicide have no involvement with any of these crisis organisations. So you could increase the budget tenfold, but it's not going to make a difference to half. And the half who do commit suicide did have an involvement with them. So we would rather get involved early on. If everyone had a, 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 a mentoring relationship where the trust had developed, then I believe we would see a lot fewer mental health issues. We would see a lot fewer people in crisis. Um, any questions? Tony, great question. And there's, there's over 30,000 organisations in the mental health space in Australia, which is an unbelievable number. I didn't believe it when I first heard it, but apparently that's, that's the case. So there's a lack of funds going around, and most of the funds go to people at the end of the conveyor belt. But 
what we're seeing is the increasing realisation that it's not working. As I said at the start, we've never been more lonely, isolated, anxious, depressed or suicidal. So there's a growing recognition there and they've realised that prevention is a much better way of going. Um, we're in the process, hopefully, of getting a grant around this uh, from, the, from the government, um, and which should be fantastic. And we're also approaching corporates, because unfortunately the, the, the discussion often goes to suicide, but there's a whole lot of other misery. There's a lot of time off work. There's a, there's a good, there's a good uh, uh, value proposition to corporates to get behind something like this, because we can, we can help their staff. It's, uh, so this, this will be an international program eventually, so it's a really good thing. So we've got guys going out talking to corporates now to see if they want to get behind this prospect. some funding, but yeah, the, the governments can change, the white ribbon organisations stop getting government funding about 12 months ago, so it's called fickle, so things can change, and, and corporates should be much better long-term stable, so, yeah, which is what we're, we're looking at, and the, the, um, the grant that we're expecting to get from the government, there is a lot of reporting requirements around that, but, uh, but it's, in this case, I think it's a fantastic proposal for the government in this area want to put can't get too much information about that. But it's but spot on. And we, we want to get corporate funding. We want to, uh, yeah. Uh, I think you asked how many, we've got um, several hundred people in the program already, but the growth has been phenomenal over the last few months. And under COVID, um, I, I talked to you about the mentoring side of things, but we also run Zoom uh, meetings to get men together and connected. Yeah. So next, next uh, Wednesday week, we've got the head of the Australian Men's Health Forum coming to uh, speak. Uh, they they connect all the men's mental health organisations around Australia. Um, so uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had the guy who runs uh, uh, talking on executive loneliness. So uh, so yeah. So Zoom has opened up a lot of opportunities to grow. Yeah. What's the number on Zoom? <laughs> Do you know what it's going to be? Uh, it's, if, a few Zooms myself. Yeah. If um if I'll hand out some of these, but oh. if you. If you go to our website and look under events, you'll see uh, it's, it's actually not posted yet, but you'll see it there. Or at, we're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Instagram. Um, well, welcome to the politics in the pub, and uh, we'd like to give a political dimension to the discussion as well. And you've spoken about funding, which is very legitimate, but it's also we also like I'd like to explore the a dimension of sustainability of such programs and also uh, a framework or paradigm if you may on how to deal with the mental illness problem among men I think that's a focus here um, part of it really is uh, to be political about it is if we if we reduce our right to work as commodity rather than a right because if it were a right we would be we should first be able to work for ourselves on our terms until someone or something is able to give us a better deal right so one of my advocacies and as a political economist is to push for a kind of universal basic income so that everyone enjoys that same freedom now if that would if such a policy would arise would that help your work a lot more would it make it easier both as mentors and as uh, in terms of your market I understand the question, but it's outside my pay scale, and I, I'm not a. Uh, my, my background is an IT manager, 
it's, uh, I just feel called to do this for the reasons I said before. Um, I, um, so I, I can't comment on, on the idea of a, uh, like what they do in Scandinavia where the, the wealth is more evenly distributed. Uh, we were talking before, I, I see in America where there's never been a bigger gap between the haves and the have-nots and, and there could be some major ramifications of that. But can I highlight on a political front something I think should change? So we applied for DGR, Deductible Gift Recipient Status. So what that means is that anyone who donates money to us gets it's a 100% tax deduction. But we, we, there's a number of categories under that and we got it under Public Benevolent Institution. And what the lawyer said to me, and you've got to understand how this works, if you teach people to swim, you're not covered. You've got to save them when they're drowning. And this is what's going wrong here. It's the same model. If we prevent someone going to crisis, there's no... It's cheaper. Uh, oh, it's cheaper, but there's no, there's no fun. And it's very hard. How, how, do you, how do you prove... I mean, all the figures are going the wrong way. I said, everything, every measure is getting worse. Yes. But how do you measure the effectiveness of a preventative program? And if it does come down, so it's, it's a really hard issue. But to me, without a doubt, it's a much smarter. So my background is IT. We would go through a development life cycle, requirements, design, build, test, implement, support. If you, the cost of finding an issue in requirements might be a dollar. Get into production at $10,000. It's that order of magnitude going up. So far better on the prevention side. I mean, that's what that conveyor belt video is meant to show. Get really supportive. And, and I support that. And yeah. I'm not that yeah. that's systemic. Yeah. Systemic framework as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay, is that it? Are we finished? The question? I think we can go into Ben and then have more questions. We just put my Okay, um good evening everybody. So my name is Ben Hughes and I am co founder of something called the Men's Table. Um, before I kind of start talking about the men's table, I just want to tell you a little bit about one of my favourite comedians. And his name is Mickey Flanagan. Mickey Flanagan likes to go down the pub. And he goes down the pub on a Friday night, and he comes back, and his wife says to him, So Mickey, how was the pub? How were all the mates that you went down the pub with? And he said, Yeah, it was great, it's fantastic. And his wife says, How was Sue? How was Sue? He said, well, I don't know, I just went down the pub with all my mates. And she said, well, Tony was there. Did you ask Tony how Sue was? And he said, no, I didn't even ask Tony how he was. So men are pretty funny. They don't, look, they don't even look after themselves. They don't look after their health. Thank you, at least I got one laugh. <laughs> they don't look after them, their own health, and they certainly don't look after their mates' health. So in... Let me just, where are we going to go with this? So this is the original men's table. So in 2011, I was a member of a business networking group. I was feeling extremely unhappy. I was very depressed. Um, and at the end of that meeting, I turned around and I talked to two men and I said to them, I'm really depressed. I feel very unhappy. Um, I've been through a very destructive uh, breakup. I'm worried about my son, self-employment's not going well. Now they said the conversation turned a little bit darker after that, and I can't remember that, but basically what they said back to me was, mate, I know exactly how you feel. I feel exactly the same way. And after, at one moment I thought, there's something in this. If you open the door for a man to walk through by being vulnerable and being accessible, it allows them to walk through and do exactly the same thing. So the next week I stood up in this business networking group and said, I'm going to start a men's group, who's in? So this is part of our table, this is in the Shakespeare pub. We've been meeting on the third Wednesday every month since June 2011. We've got 11 of the original 12 guys still meeting. So over nine years, 11 of the 12 are still there. Oh, I'll come back to that one. At the beginning of last year, one of these guys, this is David, my co-founder, he gave me a call and said, what are we going to do about men's work? Men are in crisis. What are we going to do about it? So we got together, we went back to our original table and said, what has worked for you guys over the last nine years 
that's made this tick. One of the things is, we don't talk about politics, but I will jump into politics a little bit later. I'll particularly talk about gender politics a little bit later. Um, so what are the few, few things? So we set a few guidelines down. So these are the ones. So when we sit at a men's table, and we've now got 20 tables, we talk about I statements. How do you feel? How do you actually feel? There's no fixing. Men like to fix things. And we call this the brother-in-law story. So if somebody is telling a story, I'm telling a story about how, how unhappy I am, things have gone wrong, some man will chip in very quickly and say, oh, that happened to my brother-in-law. And he did this and he did that and it worked for him. And what's happened to me is my story's been stolen. My story is no more, it's now this guy's story. So there's absolutely no fixing. Listening, it's gotta be a safe space. So it has to be a really safe space where men feel comfortable and diversity. We believe in diversity. So each table we, we Put together, we don't want 12 men all of the same. Our age ranges range from 35, which are the new fathers, and they suddenly go, what the hell just happened to me? Right through to 82 as our oldest member. And, you know, they can learn from all of them. We talk about feelings, not beliefs. So if I, if I told you my view of the world, I don't think you would actually, but some of you might disagree with me. I think you probably have a very similar view of the world. But if I told you my view of the world, you might disagree with me. If I told you how I feel about the world, you can't disagree with me because this is how I really feel. This is coming from here, not so much from here. So we're really talking about feelings. Commitment is really important. We live in a world where people don't commit. If you go to something once and you don't like it, yeah. You don't like to go back. People get away with that. So we do ask people, men to attend nine out of the 12 tables. We ask them to grow all together. So Ian talked about community. It's all about community, which is something that's lacking. So I've got 11 guys that I now move for my life. I've been with them for nine years. Don't really like a couple of them. But we are all together. We're all men. We're all in this rowing boat doing this thing. So we are men serving men. These are some of the quotes that, we've, that have come up. One that always hits me is, I sit on the couch and I listen to my wife organizing a social life while I watch telly. A lot of men can actually feel like that because women are natural connectors. They just do it naturally. You know, whereas men are very isolated, can be very isolated beings. Ian talked a lot there about isolation and loneliness. Men are socially lazy. They don't foster their relationships with other men. They're quite happy just to sit on the couch. So we really just uh, encourage them to connect. I've got mates, but I only talk about footy and shit. It doesn't have to be footy. It could be jet engines. Or it could be something else. But what you're not talking about are the feelings. We like this one so much that we've actually put it on our t-shirts. So all our t-shirts have this. And it's a conversation point, and this is on the front of our flyers as well. We've only had a couple of people go, oh, I don't really like that, it's not appropriate. <laughs> but it's designed to be a conversation starter. So somebody will look at it and go, oh, what's this? And then it will say, men don't talk, men are lonely, men can be socially lazy. So it's one of those conversation pieces. Men don't always prioritize themselves. Now, we're often told that we've kind of got it easy. As men, as Ian said, the figures will tell you a totally different story. So we've got six men a day in Australia for suicide. 84 times a day in Australia, an ambulance is called for a man who has attempted suicide. I'll just say that again. 84 times a day, an ambulance is called in Australia for a man who has a, who's attempted suicide. They're horrible figures, and the cost of that is huge. The cost, KPMG did a study, and they reckon the cost of one suicide is $710,000. Other studies show it's more like $4 million. 
So the figure is really somewhere in the middle. It's a huge impact on society. Of course, we can't measure everything with financial measures, but it's just, as we know, it's a huge impact. This is David. This is a quick video I'll show you. Have we got the volume in good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A lot of men, I think, put all of the other people in their lives first, their partners, their families, their work colleagues, they come a very low last in their priority order. The men's table is an opportunity to put ourselves first, even just for a few hours in a month. And by doing that, rather than being selfish, it actually helps to nurture and nourish our ability to then be a father, then be a husband, then be a friend and a colleague. When we look around, most men aren't as good as women and as naturally inclined toward reaching out and making those connections with other men and sharing about how they feel. And so the men's table provides just a simple structure and a simple access point to begin the conversations with other men that then can become a regular part of their lives. To find out more about how to get involved in the men's table, reach out and make contact with us. Again, some of those, um, some of the things that we've heard, the new father is a big thing. That's kind of where it all starts, where a man will often suddenly feel, I've been relegated in the house. We used to have this relationship, now I'm a spare wheel. I don't really know what my role is. And there's a lot of confusion that the spotlight is on the mother, as it probably should be, but a little bit of the light should also fall on that father. And it doesn't really do that. Let me talk about the patriarchy and the hierarchy. Who does it serve? So I'm going to talk about a little bit of uh, gender politics here. So we believe in the corporate world the alpha male behavior is kind of the norm. You rise to the top by just being an alpha male. But success on the outside, you know, you're lost and lonely in the inside. We're firm believers that 5% of men give all other men a bad name. That's the patriarchy, okay? And that is, where are we? So we work, let me just come to that slide. So toxic masculinity. You know, this is the alpha male guy in the business. This is the road rage guy. This is the domestic violence guy. They get all the headlines and people will say, oh, typical man. 95% of us are just trying to be good men. However, unfortunately, we often get tired with that brush, which says, oh yeah, it's a typical man. But we don't have that voice. So the patriarchy doesn't serve us men either. You know, we've got the Me Too movement, which is saying, oh, men have done us wrong, blah, blah, blah. Yes, but I believe it's only 5% of those men who are the loud males, alpha males who do us wrong. 95% of us are just good guys, wanting to, you know, just want to live a good life. So there are some real stereoty stereotypes around men. Here are some stats. I don't need to read those out, so they're... Girls outperform boys, and I'll present the work workplace deaths. So those figures don't lie. They tell part of the story of what is actually going on for men. Men can be very lazy with it though. Another, just another quick video. One of the challenges for men who would most benefit from the men's table community is they are, well, not the most motivated. Fortunately, they have often have a partner in their life who sees the need. So this is for the women and the men in a man's life who recognize that their bloke is lacking connections with other men. Has work got in the way, that he has got in the way for having time to open up and connect with other men. Suddenly, are you now the only emotional outlet for your man? This often happens. Men can tend to look to the partner in their life for all their emotional support. Maybe you could encourage your man to come along to one of our entree nights. We are putting tables together that will support men in many different aspects of their life. Check out the website and maybe have a chat to him about it. We talked about prevention. Some of you might get this. The cure. Apparently they're better than the cure. So, <laughs> it's a band called Cure. Okay, anyway. <laughs> so, uh, the cost is phenomenal. The cost is absolutely phenomenal for, you know, 
putting things in place, calling an ambulance to a bottom of a cliff to pick somebody up, all those kind of things. It's very hard for us to say we put men in a room and we give them the warm and fuzzies because we'll get no funding for that. We do talk about suicide, the pointy end, uh, and I can't phrase it any other better than the, the sexy end. So if a government can say, well, we put this in place, six men a day were, were suiciding, and now only four men are suiciding, that's where the money will be. But there's a lot more that's going on for them. So it's not all about that, but the prevention is so, so important. We talked to somebody who used to run a very big healthcare, and he said forever, for the 30 years he was in the industry, people have been talking about prevention, but no action is ever taken around that. So hopefully, we'll get together and uh, do a little bit of that prevention. How are we different? We commit to the long term. I won't go through those too much. This is where we are right now. So, same as Ian, we've just seen this great. Now is the time. There are a huge amount of organisations in the men's space in particular, underfunded, well-meaning people doing amazing work. So collaboration is how we're going to go forward around just bringing that all together. So that's where we are. That's who's at the t that, who are at the tables. I'll just kind of skip through those. And this is what men have been saying. Um, men say, basically, I've shared things I've shared with nobody else before. I've shared things I've never shared with my wife. Once that, you know, that whole thing breaks down, so it's around about the trust. It's called social penetration theory. If I drop into a deep level of conversation about how I feel, I give you the right and the access to access your own feelings. So with the men's room, I'm sure it's exactly the same thing. You're dropping into that deeper level of conversation. You're not just talking about fully and shit. We run something called Entrees. Our next one is on Monday. It's on the 27th. Uh, it's online because that's the way we have to do it at the moment. Um, just go to Human Humanitics, look up the men's table, and you'll come across us. And we run you through what exactly happens and some more of the fundamentals about that. Um, one thing I can say is with COVID and what's coming up is we are seeing a real uptick in, in interest, um, very sadly, particularly as a lot of men lose their identity, which has been their work for a long period of time. Um, funding, I'll, I'll talk about funding as well. It's pretty thin. We were you know, the public purse is completely dried up. The corporate purse is not great at the moment. And government, well, it's very hard to get some money out of the government. You've got to talk to the right people. So, um, any questions at all? More figurative, so around about 35. So when they become fathers, but the men at our table are the uh, our youngest of 35. So, but when men, men become fathers, that's the first moment really in their life when they go, hmm, what's happening here?
comes down to sort of men's alienation in a, in a society that's a capitalist society and also a patriarchal society. And, this, and the structural questions which cannot be escaped from is that, um, you know, the, the men um, have a higher income than women. We still, you know, so we're, if we talk about the family, we still got the problem of women work, who are working are getting lower incomes and are getting higher incomes, so they're, they're more expected of them. And in the home, and this is very interesting what I've seen from what's happened under COVID. Please let me see the question. Yeah, okay, I'm just going to say a couple of things. So you've said more than a couple of things. Right, I'm going to say a couple of more things. things. Um, the, you know, in, unless we equalise work in the home, homework and cooking and all the other domestic chores, that's not, we're not going to solve this problem. Because we've got to have equality between men and women. I think, I think the solution to the problem of men Question. is part of the solution the problem with women. So the two things are completely interlinked and I think um, that's why we need to look at both half, both sides of the equation. So we'll have some comment please. If you look at both sides of the equation. Thank you both for your presentations and just a question for both of you. Um, I do a lot of work with um, asylum seekers um, and so just wondering if um, yeah. both of your organisations, whether you've tried to target particularly vulnerable groups of men, such as asylum seekers or having an experience working with this government grant we're, we're working with indigenous people and we have a number of we have a, a really broad range of, of, of cultures already in, in the organisations and mentors that I um, the, the, lost it. the only thing these guys have in common so there is a desire to help another bloke in life but they can be from every culture, from every language. In fact, one of the things we ask what languages people speak on their application forms, and there's this diverse range. There must be 40 or 50 different languages, and that's one of the things we would match men on, would be their, their cultural preference or their language. So, yeah, emphatic, yes. Yeah. Uh, diversity is really important to us. We're not as diverse as we would like, I'd be quite honest with you, because we haven't had the funding or the hours to kind of go out and, and reach that. The, the one group we are looking at doing something with is high-functioning autistic men. We've been approached to set up because they tend to be very isolated. Um, so we're, we're looking at, at setting, potentially setting up a table for that, but again, that needs funding. Um, but we're not as diverse as we'd like. You know, diversity is, is coming key, but we're not as diverse as we'd like. <laughs> as yet. And there, she's waiting for an opportunity. <laughs> Curious, where are you located these two, uh, are you connected these two branches? No. Not a synergy, synergy between the two. So ours is one-on-one, -on -one. this is guys getting together and, and having meaningful chats over a meal. Or so how someone can get in touch with, uh, do you have a group? Or do you have any kind of program? How are you helping these people? Yeah, Both of you. So, so, you. So, if they, so if you go to our website, you, there's forms there that people can, can apply to be a mentor. So someone who's supporting someone else. Or we call them a mentee. Someone who actually wants to have a mentor in their life. Someone who will listen to them. And we put a lot of thought into matching. How hard is it? It's only... We, the main mentor in my life was a woman, but we don't that we don't have women in the mentor role. Oh, and I know discrimination. There, <laughs> there is a reason That's for this. So Could I just explain? So many I of these guys. I I, I, but I just put out this next photo. I agree with that. Okay. Many of these men are lonely and isolated, and if a woman starts paying a lot of focus and attention, it could be misconstrued and it just, it just wasn't, it wasn't worth the I, I, uh, also, I, I would like to uh, feel safe and respected. So I'm a former physio, so I study like this last year I finished a college of complementary medicine and 
I do a group healing and a mentoring, so I consider myself expert in everything. And I am open to do a group if anybody is interested in that, in community center or something like this. So we can exchange the details and if something come up. So I'm full of uh, optimistic person, <laughs> so I like to make people happy because it's very simple. Just the lack of education, that is my opinion. The government does not teach us since a child. Oh, this is the problem. The, ch the education is, you know, it's not right. But sometimes I think there's a tendency to think the government should fix yeah. all the issues. And, of and course, this it's education I call. If it is come from the government, so I call this education, I call this enlightenment. Because since the children are born, we have to have knowledge. Okay? Especially when the, the families are not, uh, doesn't have this knowledge, so somebody has to step in. We know everybody is getting life right if they have some mentor in early childhood. Okay? We know that. It's simple. Okay, question. Another question? Yeah. Um, very, very quickly, I'll quickly talk about the, the women. We had a women advisory board, 10 women. The answer they came up with, it has to be man to man. Just yeah, women yeah, telling us that. Yeah, my question relates quite heavily on the, the prison system, the incarceration rates. Um, I'm wondering if, this is a question for both of you, uh, whether you have explored the possibility of going into the prisons as the, um, the Quakers uh, worldwide, with the alternative to violence program that they run, um, seek to address issues, um, men and women, this is, but in your case, men, um, that have uh, manifested to such a point that those people, um, for various reasons, and a lot of them have to do with relationships, so to answer the first part is yes, we've been talking to the Department of Corrective Services and we have guys in the program that come from the prison system. Um, it's, there's a huge rate of repeat offenders. I believe that when the guards, if someone leaves the prison system, it's, we'll see you soon, is the message that they say to these guys. And I believe there's studies that have shown that the vast majority of the men in the prison system never had a decent male role model. So it's all coming back to this root cause. We tend to focus on the symptom, not the cause. And um, that's, I believe that through programs like this, we'll reduce the number of men going to prison. And, and that's, a, I think, a much smarter way. In terms of actually going into the prisons themselves, no, we haven't done that. There is a, a I think there's Shine run a program that do that. We, we would support them coming out and obviously try and prevent them going in. As we, all know, as, we all, as we all know, it's generational. So, you know, if they haven't had a mentor, as a, as a, particularly the father, and the grandfather wasn't, you know, it just goes on from generation to generation. You know, best time to plant a, tea, a tree is 20 years ago or now. So what we're doing is trying to plant the tree now. That's all we're doing. Hmm. Okay, wait, wait a minute. Okay, yeah. Once. Yeah. Yeah. Is that all? Oh, thank you. <coughs> thank you for your... Let's have a look. Yeah, okay. Thank you for the talk as well. Um, I, I assumed the female role when I came to Australia. I came as a carer for my aged parents who were immigrants here in the 80s. And it posed a pretty strong challenge to me because why it's, the question was, why are you assuming the role of carer? And I said, why not? It is a uh, filial duty. And second, the second problem was uh, some people thought, ended up thinking I was gay. No. Not, not that there's anything wrong with it, but I'm not. And it's, it's, it's kind of creepy to assume that I'm of that gender when just because of my choice in position. And my question really tends to the political dimension again since this is politics in the public, how many of, the, of your, your peers feel that 
the responsibility of their problems is sheerly due to their individual fault or choices rather than an awareness that many times it is because of a system, an environment, misconceived notions that just drum down on them that you know, this is all on you, this is all your fault. Because I've heard many, and unemployment artists in particular saying, yes, it's my fault that I am an artist and because of my choice, I'm not able to find productive employment. And I said, what? Who the hell told you that? Oh, apparently that's what they've, they've been told by some people in the center, right? And I said, well, tell them to go to hell. They have no right to tell you, to talk to you that way. And I think that's one of the biggest problems of not just men, but women. That the system tells us that it's our fault. And I even dare say, to the extent of to my friends in the feminist movement, I think it's unfair to be a feminist to the extent of pushing some people to be ashamed of being men. Because I've seen some men who've actually been ashamed to be men and guilty about being men. I said, hey, you're not supposed to go that far. Who pushed you to that extent? You're supposed to be proud of who you are. And so that's my question. To what extent do you see that people take an unfair burden on their individuality? rather than realize that sometimes it's because of the wrong paradigms, the wrong frameworks, the wrong social messages that are drummed into their heads. I'm not an expert on this. I'm not sure if that is working. I'm not an expert on, the, on this, but I, I do think that men tend to internalize more things because they don't often have an outlet to get it out and talk things through. They tend to be, you know, they say no man is an island, but quite often they are. So I think there's a lot, lot of internalization. I don't really want to go down the political path too much because what we do is we don't talk politics. If we talk politics at our tables, they would fracture very quickly because you get very different views. So religion and politics completely out. My personal view is that the system is completely broken and that's causing pain for a lot of people. So that's my personal view. I think, as I said, 5% of men give all men a bad name. They clump, kind of clump together because of that, that, that guy who gets the headlines all the time. So that's my per very personal view. I don't know if I've answered your question, but yeah, I have a, an issue with the way the equality that's around. So, so as an IT manager, just delivering software changes, I was earning about six times as much money as my wife who works in the operating theatres as a nurse. And I would argue that her value to society, and, and she'd recently been working in the COVID area, when uh, it's, it, it, it is all screwed up. And people have got these amazing artistic talents get over. I guess it's just the capitalist system that we work under. But yeah, it just doesn't seem right to me. I, I agree with you, but I've got no idea how to fix that. Supply and demand for this. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this has been a very earthy, down-to-earth discussion we had.